<laughs> well, our story starts in 2012. Um, we had a lot of new insight into Van Gogh's letters and studio practice that we wanted to share with our audiences. And uh, we were also starting a series of uh, building projects in a museum to improve our crowd control and our visitor experience, including a total new collection installation which was launched in 2014, I see you nodding, <laughs> and the opening of our new entrance last week. Um, so um, we knew that um, attendance was growing for our institution and more and more we realized Van Gogh, he's like the Elvis Presley of art. Even if you know nothing about art, you know Van Gogh, you know some of his paintings, you know something about his life. If you go to Amsterdam, you want to see the Van Gogh Museum or online you go check him out. Um, and we were on a mission to transform um, the experience of our visitors and the way they engage with the collection and with us as an organization. And we could clearly see the opportunity for digital. With an average age of our visitors of 32 years old, we knew that digital could really work for us. And we had a picture of what might be possible in our head. We had a vision of a new website, which got an award yesterday, thank you. And a new mobile interpretation guide, and new apps and uh, online services. But more than that, we wanted to be in the driving seat. We wanted to be more flexible and able to adapt quickly to opportunities whenever they should arrive. And we wanted better control of our costs and increase income. We, we wanted to bring management of digital in-house. And we wanted to be able to assure the quality of the content. Of course, all of this will benefit to a better visitor experience. Today we'll focus on the multimedia tour because we think that's a really nice example of where you can change your brand experience. We have a long track of digital innovation, including iPhone and iPad apps like uh, Touch Van Gogh or Van Gogh's Letters. Is it working? Yeah, or Van Gogh's Letters. Um, and we knew that digital innovation can come with really great challenges. So we started a year of research and investigation, formal and informal. Uh, our, brand mar our marketing team carried out research into our audiences and developed a new brand identity. And more and more awareness grew that although we knew a lot about Van Gogh, not necessarily our audiences wanted to know it all. Sounds familiar to you? <laughs> That's always the problem, being in education. <laughs> um, but this helped us a lot, this brand identity and matching it with um, what we all knew to make choices in interpretation. And we talked to you, a lot of people in this room, we talked to you about what you had done, what worked, what didn't work, what went really horribly wrong. And more and more we became aware there wasn't just one ready-made solution out there. Um, to get the results we wanted, we were going to have to innovate. But how? How do you innovate? Would we be successful or would it be a horrible disaster? How could we balance between opportunity and really high risks? So he spent a great time, uh, a lot of time in creating briefs. We were clear what we were looking for. We wanted innovation. And we did our best to manage the risk by being as careful and detailed as possible um, of the solution and what it should be or should not be. You know, long lists of requirements in your briefs. And I think it's fair to say right now that um, our expectation was that success would lie in picking the right idea. Um, but um, Fabrique and frankly, Green and Webb, sorry to say, um, they told us if innovation is your goal, we can't pin that down the answer in advance. We need to do work together to figure out what will really deliver the results you are looking for. They offered us instead a process and a way to collaborate. They said rather bluntly, even for us Dutch people, if you do what you always did, you get what you always got. You, we need to design what works for you, for your audience, for your museum, and for your brands. Not put a new code on what worked for someone else. And somehow, it turned out that all the research and thinking we had done um, has led us to, well, not pin all our hopes on that one bright idea or that one product, but to open up our minds to work in a new way, in a different approach, 
So we embarked on a project that uses process and research to help manage the risk and deliver innovation and along the way transform the organization. Up to you, Evelyn. <laughs> to the final results. So this is what we did. We set objectives and we write it as a shared manifesto. We did research and we used user-centered design and we designed the experience rather than the product. So as Martin mentioned, the briefs were long, were detailed, they were about requirements, about features, about technologies. Uh, it should have eye beacons, AR, everything. So now a good designer wants to solve problems through design, and that can really be very difficult, if, and it's never as difficult as trying to fit a solution to the problem. So the first thing we did with the requirements was to set them aside. We didn't really throw them away, but almost. We started by trying to understand why they were doing these projects and asking what success would look like. So we spoke to the staff from senior management to front of house staff from marketing and communications to IT. So we asked if this project is successful, how would you know and what would it look like for you? And when and what should you be consulted? So how do these projects affect your job? So we looked at the existing data and the existing research and then we worked with the museum to refine the objective. pages of requirements to this. So now we knew where we to focus on for to solving their problem. So these are great and clear objectives, but we needed a bit more detail. After all, offering free ice cream might improve the experience, but we guessed that wasn't what the museum needed. So the next exercise was to put a bit more flesh on the bones of these objectives. The educational department was already aware that to reach their educational goals, they had to work together with curatorial department, with services, with IT, and with marketing. And we did this through the creation of a manifesto for the project to create a joint vision and commitment from all of the departments. And the manifesto is a great way to take individuals from multiple departments and create both a team and a shared vision of what success would look like. The exercise asks people to identify what is important to them, far more importantly also why it is important. For example, one of the key points proposed for our manifesto was that the service was this, easy to use in every context. The discussion highlighted that marketing felt this was very important because their branding research had suggested that the audience were turned off by anything that looked like hard work. And visitor service told us that they were currently spending too long helping visitors understand how to use the current guide and that was, was expensive for them. In other words, from the exercise, everyone on the teams understood what it is important and why. They discover what impact a decision can have on their colleagues and on the organizational staff. This fosters understanding and respect. But it allows also for designers to do what they do, they do best, solve problems through design. And ideas from anyone, the museum, frankly, Green Abrab, or ourselves, can be challenged and tested against the manifesto point. So now that I said ideas, one of the unexpected benefits of this activity is the way it shifts away from the personal and onto the idea. So let's go to the second learning. The Van Gogh Museum has of course carried out a lot of research. And in fact the research and resulting brand positioning work was crucial to this point. What was new was the type of research the way which research was and is still embedded throughout the process informing and shaping decisions at every stage we, we had made up to now. Uh, 
so uh, we talk to uh, visitors about their experiences at the Van Gogh Museum and elsewhere. And we didn't ask them uh, what their, if they liked our ideas. We didn't ask them what they, we should give them. Uh, we asked them what they did, when and why. We asked them what mattered to them and uh, what, when they'd had their best experiences. In other words, we used visitors as expert witnesses in their own experiences um, and their thoughts and their feelings. And we then used insights from that and those from the branding work as well to inform the design decisions. So let's, so let's look just at, at one aspect of this. So the research, both from the branding team and our own, showed that our target audience were very young, at the average age of the visitor to the Van Gogh Museum is 32. They are not frequent museum goers, and as Ebeline alluded to, they really don't like anything that looks like hard work. They've probably got a hangover. They think they know Van Gogh. Um, they want to get closer to him as a person, not particularly as an artist. They don't know much about art. Um, and I suppose, despite our fears, they don't dislike guides. They have absolutely no idea what a guide's like. And that learning was a real challenge to a lot of assumptions in the whole project team. I think there was an assumption that visitors were more likely to take a guide uh, that offered more. So that would be more content, more personalization, more features, more depth and choice. Um, and it was also a challenge to the curators who felt that uh, they w they, their real desire was that visitors would, would understand Van Gogh better um, and that they, they wouldn't think that he's this crazy guy who painted the sunflowers and chopped his ear off and it was, it was all about mental anguish. But the really interesting thing was that challenge, the difference between the visitor and, and the internal ex desires, turned out to be the fuel for the development of the central concept and a very detailed and rigorous content strategy. Instead of, for example, the curators and the education team asking comms and marketing to apply a brand coating uh, to their ideas, or Marcom coming to education and saying, uh, can you fill our idea with content? We worked as a group together, and we asked, what would it take to bridge that gap? What is the core idea for that experience? And the visitor research was a really powerful tool in this. We, um, we used it to identify the bright spots that were happening already, a moment that worked really well for both visitors and the museum. And we realized that what often gave them the greatest delight and understanding was the moment when their preconceptions were flipped. The moment had this incredible emotional um, and intellectual power for visitors that really engaged them. And it was from this that we developed the central idea. And that is that the guide will reveal a Van Gogh you never knew. Um, and once we had identified that opportunity, it became a matter of how we would roll it out in every facet of the service, and we could all pull in the same direction. The results have been really impressive for the project. Um, over 75% of users are able to recall specific learning outcomes that align with the museum objectives. We had just four core learning objectives, and more than three quarters of our visitors can name them. Um, and the guide users are more likely to have a better than expected visit to the museum uh, than non-guide users, and they are more likely to select positive brand descriptors of the museum than non-users. Um, but there have also been quite important internal effects as well. An important outcome of, of this was the way in which um, this process allowed us to have evidence-driven decision-making within the team. So rather than a, an opinion, the guide should be this or that, and I like green and you like red, um, it brought together the team and we could actually use the evidence to make those choices. And I think, importantly for all of us, it, it helped bridge that gap between curatorial and commercial. It was, it was really very powerful. So our final, our final learning. The third thing we did differently was we stopped thinking about products. Um, and we started thinking about experience. So this was a really critical decision for us all. Um, and that was we 
trying to design the visitor experience and then design the surfaces that, that were needed to support it. The driving force behind the, the project was the educational department. The, already at the start of the pitch, they, they had begun to include the services team, marketing and curatorial. So there was already that awareness to reach the educational goals, um, to say as the Dutch say, we uh, all have to put our noses in the same direction. Actually, a lot of the project is about sharing proverbs. Um, but <laughs> we all needed to kind of get that common understanding. So what is service design? Service design is a form of conceptual design which involves the activity of planning and organizing people, infrastructure, communication, and material components of a service in order to improve its quality and the interaction between the service provider and customers. That's a really long definition, sorry. For the Van Gogh Museum, that meant thinking about the visitor experience from the moment they first think of coming to the museum, or in fact, the first moment coming to Amsterdam, and mapping it out to show the experience, the possible touch points, and therefore allowing us to look at those and design improvements for them. It allowed the designers to think not about separate products, the website, the guide, apps to come, but what we wanted to achieve at each point in the visitor journey. As part of this process, we identified that one of the biggest pain points for both the museum and the visitor was this moment of transaction. This is the point at which they actually purchased the guide. It was taking on average a minute and a half to hand over the device, explain how to use it, and set the visitor going. Staff had to press sort of multiple options to set it up. The guide offered the visitors multiple options and functionality, and so staff had become anxious to explain and make sure everything was all right, and the visitor was still struggling to take it all in, so they asked more questions, and this all added to the queue. And with 1.6 million visitors, a pickup rate we needed to increase, and major crowd control issues, every second we could win to quicken that process was really, really important. So we saw this tough challenge as a design opportunity, a design challenge. And we saw the chance to improve the experience for both the visitors and the staff. Our focus became how could we make this point as frictionless as possible, a smooth choreographed experience between the visitor, staff and device. And all the different teams were employed to come up with a solution and design this point. So it's content, interface, staff and device. So what was the result? Uh, here's what the digital side of it looked like. We took the instruction process away from the staff and we created and tested an onboarding process through which the visitors are instructed in their own language. That's, that's one of the other issues. People speak speaking multiple languages as a second language often. And so they're instructed in their own language and step through that process. And I think looking at this, this looks so ridiculously simple possibly obvious that it's really um, hard to see this as innovation. I, I, I know that. But after more than 20 years of, of working in mobile, I can, I can say I really feel it's a, a step forward. Part of it was about making the offer as simple and user-focused as possible to reduce confusion and increase confidence that they knew what they were getting. So one of the things we had done is we actually use the visitor's own words to describe the experiences. So when we asked people, why don't you take the guide? They said, oh, I want to go at my own pace. I want to explore at leisure. I don't want to be told what to go. So I want to explore at leisure. And we tested multiple options. Um, we tried the full tour, the full experience. They didn't want that. Sounded like hard work. The brand research got it absolutely spot on. Um, and then for the content, the content is based on what was important to the visitor. So the description, what we tell them about it is how long it takes, what it is offered, and what they get to do. And then we have sort of the physical user experience. The staff are trained to reassure but not instruct. And by focusing on this pain point, the museum has saved staffing costs. They've increased their capacity to serve visitors and they've improved the quality of visitor um, 
experience. Focusing on this small moment was about making choices about what happens with the people and what happens with the technology. And focusing on that small moment has increased the number of users and the profit to the museum. Handout time has been reduced by about 30%. And take-up has increased from 16% to around 25%. And that's so we're talking about sort of 60% almost um, additional users. So what has the impact been? Um, as you can see, we've managed to, to have a significant impact on both our visitors and our income. Um, to wrap it up for you, 1% um, more pickup rate, 1% more of our visitors using the multimedia tour gives 12,000 visitors a better experience and generates over 70,000 euros, a way larger ex uh, impact than we ever expected from them when we started dreaming about digital information, uh, transformation. Because, you know, um, technical change in my experience, can sometimes feel so fast for a museum. It's so hard to keep up with. We constantly feel we are behind the times. We need to do more. Um, when the first digital um, change for museums came, and in many instances, we did the same thing. It has been about uh, creating more stuff, new technologies, new products added to an existing experience. And each thought about really well. It's designed on its own. but this can be a real risk to museums. Uh, we can end up designing digital experiences instead of museum experiences. We can um, use too much digital or use it in the wrong places. As time passes, it more and more becomes clear to, to us that um, digital, it's like the wheel. It's like electricity. It's less about the what and more about the, the how and the when. We, we ask now, how can digital help us to reach our objectives? When should we use it to have a maximum impact? In other words, it's about making smart choices about what is most important to us. It's like what TechCrunch wrote uh, a term ago. Um, digital transformation, it's not about a digital department. It's about reconsidering the entire purchase and the entire relationship with your customers. And that's why we are not longer aiming at creating the newest digital gadgets. We want to use digital to make the life and work of Vincent van Gogh accessible to as many people as possible worldwide to inspire them. Um, that's not a one department job. That's not something I can do from education. That's an ongoing joint venture for many departments to improve our services to our audiences. Digital does not change our mission. Um, it helps us to reach out our mission to inspire as many people as possible, to move people with art the same way as Van Gogh himself wanted to do. The most magical experience we can offer to people is when you're standing in our museum, close to a painting, looking at the brush strokes. So in our new vision, the best digital strategy is when we know when to say digital isn't the right solution to solve this uh, 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 case. In our transformation, it is that we now work together to make this choice. It's not one department, it's a joint choice you make. We ask whether digital can help us to solve a problem rather than how we can use technology. And well, I think slowly we are getting there. So let's leave the last words to our visitors. Thank you.